Uh, so I was saying that your presence here is, uh, gives weight to the importance of school board elections across the region for the success of our children in school. I'm John Reed. I'm a community volunteer, board member of the Charleston Forum, and I'll be serving as the moderator tonight for this kind of forum. And the sponsors of this forum are the League of Women Voters of the Charleston area, the Greater Somerville Dorchester County Chamber of Commerce, and the Somerville Journal Scene. I'd like to thank them and our hosts for uh, setting this up for us, as well as the district office here for letting us uh, into their facilities. As most of you know, on November 5th, this district, along with many others, is transitioning to a single member district representation. And that means that while those individuals who are elected to the board will be expected to act cohesively on behalf of children and the district, they will be representing individual districts. So it's very important to know what district you're in, and for those who are uncertain, there's a map just outside the hallway that can tell you a little bit more about what's where. Voters in seven districts will choose someone to represent them on the school board, but only in three of those districts are the school board races contested. Voters in one, five, and seven only will vote in a contested race, these are the candidates who will be with us this evening, that are here this evening, fortunately. The candidate forum is not a debate. It is an opportunity for candidates to share their platform with the community. The sponsors of this event are nonpartisan, and this is a nonpartisan event. This forum is being recorded. It will be uploaded to the LEADS website so that interested voters can view it later. Recordings are the property of the sponsors, and permission must be obtained before sharing the video with anyone else. Well, in alphabetical order and by district, these are the candidates for the Dorchester 2 School Board that you'll be hearing from this evening. From District 1, Dustin Farnsworth, Eric Unger. From District 5, Cynthia Powell, and Mr. Zingaro, Glenn Zingaro, Zanger, Zingarino, pardon me, and District 7, Patrick Davidson, and Tim Lee. Thank you for being with us. Candidates tonight will be responding to six or seven questions prepared by me and others, which the candidates have not seen. The same question will be posed to all six candidates. They will be responding in alternating alphabetical order by last name, rotating through each district. For example, for the candidate opening statements, it will be Mr. Farnsworth, and then Mr. Unger from District 1, and then Ms. Powell, and Mr. Cingarino, and then so on. Uh, it gets a little complicated. We will be not only rotating in reverse order in the alphabet, but we will be moving through the districts in a rotational basis, and the whole purpose of it is so that once the question is read, all of the candidates have a roughly equal amount of time to think about the question before they're actually called upon to answer. Closing statements will be in the reverse order of the opening statements. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to make an opening and closing statement. Candidates will have 90 seconds each to respond to questions. A candidate may take an additional 60 seconds for rebuttal after all of the candidates have responded. A rebuttal is an opposing argument or a contradiction to what another candidate has said. If you wish to make a rebuttal, just signal me by raising your hand, and uh, I will go in the order in which you see it. So I'll go from left to right. My left to right. A candidate is allowed one rebuttal per candidate. I will take rebuttals in the order I just described. We ask that the candidates use closing statements to summarize the issues they've already discussed and their vision for the position they seek. Heidi Hupp is our timekeeper. Heidi, if you identify yourself, raise your hand. As each candidate is speaking, Heidi will hold up a 30 second remaining sign, a 10 seconds remaining sign, and then a stop sign when a candidate should stop speaking. Uh, I will then, if necessary, intervene and you help to liberate you from the paragraph that you're stuck in. 
gently at first. Can you all hear me there? No. Oh, not so much. Okay, we're back on, I think. Uh, so, let's begin with opening statements. And again, each candidate has 60 seconds. Please ask the microphone as you go. Uh, our first opening statement comes from Mr. Parnsworth. All right, we've passed the baton. I apologize to the camera person. I, I am a stand and deliver and walk and talk kind of person. So, uh, good evening, John. Thank you. Uh, Lee, one of the voters. Uh, thank you. Everyone that, that's here this evening, thank you. You took, you're taking the time to come out and listen uh, to us as candidates. Uh, I will tell you, school board is so foundational. The education of our children, uh, the importance of that cannot be understated. So, I just want to say how much I appreciate each and every one of you um, for being here this evening. Um, super quick, it's amazing to be in this auditorium. I've seen both of my kids when this was uh, Rollins Middle School of the Arts. I've seen them perform on this stage and to now be back here and be able to serve um, our community is, is absolutely amazing. It's all about my why. My why is really, really, really easy. My why is all about our kids. I've got children in our school district. My wife is an educator in our school district. We have a local business here. It's really, really, really important to me. Dorchester District 2, I love Dorchester District 2. I love what I get to do. And again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farnsworth. Mr. Unger. My name is Eric Unger. I'm Dorchester District 2, District 1. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you to all our sponsors and our audience. Um, my background, I am a construction consultant. I started my business back when I was 26. I plan the most time and cost efficient way to build commercial products so they can come to fruition. Uh, that gives me, I think, a unique perspective on, on the job of detailing in front of the school board. I have four kids through the system. Uh, she went to college, she's still in high school. And I uh, look forward to answering your questions tonight. My campaign is about new vision to help our kids discover their passions. We need a strong foundational uh, financial foundation. We need to eliminate the negative influences. We have to do a lot better in design-based initiatives, getting new classes, and really helping our kids discover what their passions are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Rucker. Ms. Powell. Great evening. In order to save some extra time, I'm going to echo all the thank yous that they already said. And I'm um, just saying, my name is Cynthia Powell. I am a product of Somerville High School. I received my BS in elementary ed and paint at Payne College in Augusta, Georgia. I received my master's from the Citadel, Citadel Military College and my certification in um, school administration. I am on the board and running again for the board because I love teaching. I love students. I love the idea of them knowing when they leave high school how to function in order to make a better place for them to live community and also be able to support themselves and their families. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Mr. Zingarino. Well, as you heard, my name is Glenn Zingarino. I am running for the to school board C5 with Cynthia Powell. I have five core principles that I believe in. First is parental rights. Second is academic excellence. Third is understanding how to budget our money efficiently. Fourth is safety and security. And the fifth would be local control in terms of education. Um, hopefully tonight I'll get an opportunity to talk to you a little bit more about each of those things and how I feel about them. I do not have children or grandchildren in this system. Um, they are in another state. But I am uh, alarmed by what I see across the country. And because of that, I want to have an opportunity to have the say in what goes on the school board, and I want parents and teachers to have that opportunity as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zingarino. On to District 7, Mr. Davidson. Thanks, guys, for being here. I'm Patrick Davidson. I'm a CPA. I'm a partner in a small firm. And I am a Newington Elementary graduate. I'm an Austin Junior High graduate. I'm an Intermediate High School graduate, Summer graduate. Um, my kids also graduated from Summer High School and College Charleston graduate. I've been in, um, been in the Low Country for the last 42 years since I've, I've moved here with my 
I'm not bothering to transfer here. Um, coached soccer for 18 years, been part of my youth Bible study at church. Um, had a passion for kids. I've done weekends mentoring for three years now. And uh, it's super fulfilling. And it breaks my heart to see some of the things that the kids are going through. There's a lot of dedicated people here in the Charleston area that is involved with weekends mentoring. I would encourage you guys to do the same. I'm not going to get the policy, but we uh, move forward. But I think I have the ideas for fixing the biggest problem which is money to pay our teachers. So I'll get to that in a little bit. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Mr. Lee. Good evening, I'm Jim Lee. I'm running for the District 7 seat. Thank you to all who put this forum together. I'm running because I'm a father of five, a grandfather of soon to be six, three of whom are students here in DD2. Everybody up here cares. If they didn't, they wouldn't be up here. I'm running because I want to bring a new creative style of leadership stewardship and governance to the DD2 school system. I also want, as part of this campaign, to try and improve what we see here tonight. Everybody says they care. I've been talking to people in the communities. Everybody cares about education. Look at the attendance here tonight. Do they really care? So part of what I want to do as part of this campaign, and if I'm fortunate to have the votes and to get elected, is to create a movement of an engaged community that's involved in our schools so that our children can achieve benefits of a public education. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. I'm going to keep that mic live and come out this way so that everybody can hear the questions. Just let me know if you're unable to hear it. Again, you have 90 seconds each to answer these questions. We are going to begin with District 5. And the first question is, what are your top three goals for the school board if you are elected in November? Uh, Mr. Zangarino and then Ms. Powell. Thank you. Excuse me to talk to all of you. Um, first and foremost, I believe that if, as a school board member, I have to be an advocate for parents and for teachers. I have no problem with and believe that a school board member should meet in the free time that teachers or parents may have off hours in a public or private place and take notes and listen to what the issues are, not only from parents but also from teachers. I think that is one of the, the, the main things that I, I truly believe in, that, that you cannot do anything successfully if there's not adequate communication. Secondly, I believe that we cannot indoctrinate children, we must educate children. And in saying that, I believe that we must eliminate programs that parents do not want in the schools, period. Parents have the ultimate say, it's their children. And third, I would say probably uh, a combination of, and I hope I have enough time to talk about it later, budgeting and school choice. I believe we uh, should allow school choice and uh, I'll talk about taxes and how that should apply later on. But thank you. Thank you, Mr. Segrino. Ms. Powell. Thank you. My three top priorities, number one, not necessarily in that order, would be to continue with the recruit and retain of top peer teachers. Um, that also means we have to find equitable funding in order to maintain those teachers. I also would like to see that we work more with bringing the parents on board. We need them. We're not trying to keep them out. We need them, but we need them to come ready to work with us in order to make sure that their children are being given the best that we can give them. If we don't have the support from the parents, the children will lose out. Because we can teach, but if they don't follow up on what we request of them to do, then, you know, that won't happen. 
and then we need parents to give us ideas. We had one volunteer and with the special ed group, and what she did is phenomenal. In my 30 years in District 2, I have never seen SPED operate as well as they're operating now because of a volunteer that came in and gave up her time in order to see it done. So I would like that to spread throughout the district. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. On to District 7, we'll begin with Mr. Lee. I didn't run for office before. I'll actually answer the questions asked. Okay, I have one top goal and that is student achievement. I have about 35 secondary goals that all feed that. Our focus should be on student achievement. We have a great school system, but with the art sticks that we use, in my view, are not adequate for our children today. If you look at our outcomes relative to our spending, relative to all the problems that we have, we are not producing children that are prepared to read and write and think and communicate at grade level once they move beyond our schools. So we have to focus on student achievement, first and foremost. That's going to be fed and supported by teacher recruitment and retention. That is a huge problem that we have, and it's not a, a problem unique to DB2. We have to think big, think and recognize the community in which we have to recruit from when it comes to, student, uh, to teachers. Third is we need strategic planning and sustainable funding for our schools. Some of you may not be old enough to remember this, but I remember a day when we used to cheer and say, wouldn't it be a great day when we had all the funding we need for education and the military had all the base sale? That's what we have to figure out. We, are not, we do not have a sustainable funding plan to deal with the unmanaged growth in this district, and that's something that has to be addressed. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the SEA, Sunnyvale Educators Association, who endorsed me this week, so I was really excited about that. Um, when I am given the opportunity to represent our school district, I plan to represent every child, every educator, and every parent in the room. My main three things that I'd like to talk about right this second are student outcome, as Mr. Lee mentioned. And as a board, our, our primary role is to manage the superintendent, not to manage educators, but the superintendent to make sure that he is helping facilitate what educators need. In a certain leadership model, we're at the bottom. We're here to ask, what do you need as an educator? How can I provide for you to be the most successful? What can we do better? How can I you know, give you every possible thing that you need? Moving on to the second item, in the end, it's a lot about money, unfortunately. Uh, Dorchester District 2 is the third lowest funded school district in the entire state. Hard to swallow, isn't it? I have a plan to fix it. The problem is, all our kids are down in eastern Dorchester County. Our primary tax rolls are in western Dorchester County. They don't match up. I've got a plan in place to do it. I'm already working on it to make it happen because it's, it's very important for our children whether they're on the school board or not. Uh, I see the 10-second sign, so I won't get to my third item, but uh, I'll be talking about it more here soon. Thank you. On to District 1, and Mr. Unger, followed by Mr. Farnsworth. Thank you. My top three goals, number one, you have to have a strong financial foundation. You need a comprehensive 20-year budget, okay? We can't keep ignoring our facilities. Okay, that's, that's very important, and when, when we ignore our facilities, you get on referendums. We get a lot of debt being passed down to our kids and our grandkids. That cycle of abuse has to stop, and we need to come up with a comprehensive 20 year budget. Second is design based innovation, which will solve a lot of problems teacher retention, disruptive kids in the schools, overcrowding. We need to build new facilities for the future, not, not just taking the same old design we had 40 years ago and doing everything exactly the same way and building it the same way. There's a lot of new classes we can do. There's um, a lot of programs we can do. Ashley Rich has a farm. We can expand that. We can do other things to make school interesting again. You want kids to achieve? Give them a reason to go to school and make it interesting. Okay? And we free up our teachers to teach and discover the passions and help the kids find those passions. We can do that with design based innovation. We have lots of experience in that. 
Third is obviously outcomes. Uh, we have 47% that meet or, or less than uh, grade level in the L in math and, and, and uh, English. Okay. Yeah, we have a 98% graduation rate. Something's off. We've got to do better with that. And it could just be the testing, um, but we can't do social promotion. Thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned, if you have a desire to rebut anything that has been said by your colleagues, show a hand and I'll pass you the microphone. Otherwise, we'll move to questions. Yeah, I beg your pardon? Yes, that's okay. Oh! I'd like to rebut. <laughs> okay, well, uh, great question. And I'll tell you, so I look at it as continued opportunities. Our continued opportunities, our goals that we will continue and have to continue to work on. Uh, number one is growth, uh, for sure, in our county, in our community. We all feel it, we feel the traffic, we feel uh, the presence of growth, right? So that impacts our school district. Um, great, that puts a lot more kiddos in, in our schools, in our classrooms, that puts an additional workload on our teachers. Um, there's a lot of pieces to growth. We have to continue to look at that in, in a whole manner, right? Feeding into that, and, and some other folks have already chatted about it, I'm talking about teacher recruitment and retention. Um, teachers, educators are our lifeblood in our school district. Children are number one, hands down, kids are number one. But the teachers and the educators, when that classroom door shuts and that's when that magic happens, they are so important. We, we have to get the best of the best. We have to have world-class educators in our school districts. So we have to continue to find ways. And, and I'm going to tell you guys, that it's not all about money. Money is a big piece of it. It's not all about money. We have to figure out how to take things off their back. We have to find creative solutions to recruit and retain the best teachers that we can. Um, lastly, I'll talk about safety and security. We have to continue that is a never-ending challenge, safety and security in our schools, because children go to school, they can't learn, they will not learn, they won't learn if they don't feel safe and secure. So we have to continue as a board of leadership to find ways to make sure that they're safe and secure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barnesworth. Any additional comments to be made at this one? Yes, ma'am. I can only do this once. You have, no, no, just once per question. So oh, okay. question. Um, I did hear something, and I may have heard it incorrectly, the sense that we don't want parents involved. We want them involved, but we want them to be involved as they work with us. Just because we are the educators does not mean we know everything, but we have been trained to do what we're doing. And what we need parents to do is come alongside of us. For instance, every child should know the first 100 words that first year to hold. For me, they should know that before they even come to school. That's something parents can do. If you need help doing something like that, contact us at the school, and we will support you in making sure that your children are ready. But to send them, don't get us help. You won't show up for the conferences. That's where we have a problem. We want you there. We want you there participating with us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bauer. Yes, Mr. Zingarino. I believe it's important for teachers to be involved. Absolutely. We need good teachers, and we need to retain them, and we also need to invest in them. But we have to have our parents deeply involved in what we do in the school district, because they are the primary decision makers. I'm not saying that they're going to choose the curriculum or teach the curriculum, but they should certainly know what it is and have an input into whether they like that curriculum, if they want changes in it, if they want things removed from it, etc. Um, that's something I believe in very strongly. You know, I, I've, I've heard quite often that um, the professionals know best. Great teachers do know a lot. They really do, and we need to invest in them. But during COVID, we said that medical professionals knew best, and we found out afterwards that not all of them were correct. So um, it's good to be humble once in a while, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. You may not. <laughs> okay. So we'll move on to question two. 
And for this question, we'll begin with District 7 and Mr. Davidson, followed by Mr. Lee. And the question is as follows. School safety is of concern to parents, teachers, and students. How can the school board enhance safety in the district's schools? 60 seconds. Yes, thank you. done a pretty good job overall compared to a lot of schools across the country, but there's always room for improvement. Right now, we have one drug safety dog that has to go to a lot of different schools. There are some federal programs for dogs that work in military environments that they possibly could have grants for. We have to stretch every dollar we can to look for that. Um, uh, one of our problems now with having a scan going through one door is kids open up other doors and let people in different places. Oftentimes, that has been problems at schools that have had terrible episodes. And for me, uh, there needs to be a lot of money everywhere. And um, we've done a lot of good jobs about praying. If you look at what a referendum is going to do, it's going to improve a lot of safety issues in different places, a lot of our different schools. Um, Going forward, I would also like to have some mobile uh, scans where kids may not know that you're going to have a, somebody with a wand right now. I would like to see our SRO officers guarantee that if there are shots fired or if there's a child risk, that they will run as fast as they can go to the scene of the crime. I've witnessed things on TV where this has not been the case before. And I don't want to hear about backup. I don't want to hear about anything else. That person, they should not be at that school. They're not prepared to jump in. I have a lot of other ideas, but 10 seconds is not going to do it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Mr. Lee. The next question will be to solve world hunger in 90 seconds. <laughs> so the question is, what can the board do about safety? Well, first and foremost, we have to listen to the safety professionals. To my knowledge, none of us up here are car carrying law enforcement officers and whatnot. So the board needs to support what those who are accountable within the district who work for superintendent have the resources they need. But I'd like to talk about this from a different lens. This is an indication of where we are as a culture and a community. And what we have to do is use, if you will, the bully pulpit of the school board. Again, getting parents involved, working with our teachers, working with the school resource officers, to figure out what can we do to drive awareness and get the community involved in this problem. Because what's happening is the schools are on the receiving end of problems that we have as a culture. And that's why it's important that we build community around this issue and so many of them, uh, so many other issues when we think about our schools. And the public schools exist for one reason, really, and that is to educate children, to prepare them with the basic skills that they need to move on to live productive lives and do so however they so choose based on their God-given gifts and abilities and their choices. If whether that's college, military, trade schools, or no school, they still need those same basic schools. But this becomes a community challenge that we need to focus on and the board can lead in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Lee. We'll move to District 1, Mr. Farnsworth, and then Mr. Humber. Yeah, great question. Safety and security, you heard me talk about it earlier. That's, that's important. It's, it, as a continued goal of the board, and, and I will tell you, I, I am very, very, very proud of what our board um, has been able to do just the last several years. You look at um, some things, so uh, for those who don't know, Chester uh, is our weapons detection dog. So he is specifically in schools there looking for weapons. Um, he also uh, acts as an emotional support animal. Super cool. Um, we were actually one of the, if not the first school district in the nation to be able to partner with our foundation in order to um, fund and, and bring Chester into our school district. Amazing opportunity. You look at things like the, uh, the open gate metal detectors. You know, the random searches that are happening, so not only are they happening in mornings, but also throughout the day, those are happening randomly right now. And our kids are, are really not looking at like our toes. So I ask for a lot. I say, um, you know, is, is this really impacting you? What, what does this mean to you? It, it really has very little impact to their daily lives, other than they know that they are safer and more secure. And, and I go back to the fact that they have to be safe and secure in order to learn. Right? And we're doing that. Our rates of weapons inside of our facilities 
uh, has basically dropped to zero. What we are finding on the opposite side now, uh, vapes, we are finding uh, massive, massive, massive amounts of vapes in our schools. So we're able to take those out. That's another great uh, kind of side benefit. So a lot of good safety and security stuff out in our district. We will continue um, to look at those aspects every single day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barnford. I guess I'm a little more focused on outside threats. Those are all well and good for inside threats, and, and those I don't think have been a really huge problem. Um, outside threats, okay, somebody coming outside, coming into school, shooting up, whatever, that's what's been happening around the country. Okay, so we can, number one, design based, Patrick uh, touched on it, design based innovation, how we design the schools, how we renovate the schools, we take security into that design and implement it into the design. There's so much more that can be done uh, under the design based method. And of course, we consult with our, our security professionals. Okay. I think also um, there's, there's lessons learned. We take every tragic event that's happened across the country, we break it down, we analyze what has happened during those events and where they failed. And we take those, those cues and we, we develop programs for, for what's actually happening in the real world. I think there's room for opportunity there. Um, I think there's room for, for expanding our resource, dual resource officers having in the classroom as well, teaching, as well as serving as a last line of defense in case we do have an outside threat. Thank you. Thank you. For this describe Ms. Powell and then Mr. Singarino. When I first ran for the board um, back in 2022, one, I had four items I wanted to concentrate on, and one was parental involvement. That is still one of my major goals that I want. I went to a skip meeting this morning, and I was shocked. I was appalled. I was upset. I was angry at our local and state national politician because of the different types of vaping that the children are able to acquire legally, and they have them marketed so that it looks like it's a um, writing pen, so that it looks like a key fob. Some of these kids have no idea what they're taking and what they are sniffing on. They don't know about the combination of how whatever the item is, how it's been mixed, whether or not they have other foreign substances in there. And so I need parents to be informed as to what their children are getting when they go just into some of the grocery stores. They're right there. I want you to go to a place like the gas station and look and see if you don't see some of the things our kids are now able to get, supposedly 18, but not necessarily. So I want parents to be aware. They are our first defense when it comes to these children. Dummy bears. Those aren't regular dummy bears. They're sitting there getting high. So that's what I want. I want the parent to be involved. I am not, the board is not anti-parent. We need you. We can't do it all. And that's one of the things you can help us with. Thank and you, save Mr. your Mr. children at the same time. Thank you so much. Mr. Sangarino. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, I'm glad to hear that parents should be involved. Um, our schools should be safe. We need strict discipline policies in our school, but we also need to do something that I have not heard here. Embrace mental health programs. We need to talk about the issues that are affecting our children because there are so many opportunities out there, so many choices to make, but our children are not good decision makers. And if you're not a good decision maker, you wind up in a world of trouble. And certainly that's true of an adult as well, but we're talking about our children. Um, that's what we need to be doing. We need to be focusing on that. And we need to make parents and teachers together advocates for innovation in the classroom. Let's change things around. Let's make things more exciting in the classroom. Let's make the children more engaged. That's what we need. I have seen across this country, and it's unfortunate, and it's, it's true here in South Carolina as well, that boards are made up mostly of people from one specific industry. And there's 
no other industries or diverse amount of industries that are uh, that people come from that are important. Those people tend to be people that think outside the box. I came from the business world. I also came from uh, military, where I was trained in active shooting, and active shooting is a big issue that we need to be talking about. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Singarino. Uh, any uh, comments, rebuttals? We'll go left to right. Mr. Bornfield. Yeah, I, I just want to touch on uh, a couple of and it was amazing. You guys have not, folks have not been into a school and seen the engagement and the excitement that our children have every single day in those classrooms. It's unbelievable. You, if you don't walk out of that school just smiling ear to ear from their um, excitement, you're, you're doing wrong. Um, and I say that because the, the balance, right, we're talking about safety and security, the balance is we, we have to create educational environments and we have to be very, very careful that we're not creating prisons. And, and I hate to even say that, but as leaders, we have to make sure we're always looking at, at that balance. How do we make sure we're providing an, an amazing educational opportunity, while at the same time providing a, a safe and secure environment for our children? You may, Mr. Sincrano. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the gentleman's comments. Leadership is one thing and one thing only influence. Nothing more, nothing less. That is what leadership is. And we need to lead our parents and our educators. And what we need to do is come together to be advocates to talk to the legislators, because obviously our schools are controlled by legislation in South Carolina and obviously in every other state. We need to come together as advocates. If we give parents a reason and teachers a reason to advocate for something, you see this room filled tonight. I'm the president of my board in my HOA. We used to have meetings where there were just a couple of people. Now we have full packed houses. Leadership. You need to give people something to work on and not make schools nothing more than big babysitting service. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. He said, we, uh, with the Zangarinos, I believe, said that we need to bring groups together in order to request from our legislators what we want. I agree with that. But let me explain. We were in D.C. about a year ago. We met with um, Senator Graham, Lindsey Graham. And we were talking about the needs and all that we had. He said, that's fine that you are here as a board member. He said, but we need to hear from the parents. You as a group of parents advocate for your children. We will join you. But we need you because he heard us, but he said we need to hear from you because you are the one that vote them in. Thank you. Thank you all. This is the third question. Oh, another rebuttal. Go right ahead. Yeah, this is a rebuttal, and specifically, but uh, uh, one thing I think is important for everyone here, uh, we used to stop it up, which basically means a kid has an app on the phone and can quickly signal that there is someone on the outside of the school trying to come in, something going on that needs to be reported. Immediately, when you have a thousand kids, the more eyes and ears you have, the quicker you find something. Well, now we're taking phones out of the classroom, so I think we need to get the stop it out. Uh, put on all our computers uh, as soon as possible so that that can still be utilized going forward. And security, like everything else in education, needs to have our goals and our goals for our superintendents. So we need to set goals to have certain improvements in certain schools, have a schedule set up for when we expect it to be done by, and make sure we follow up. And every single meeting we have should be dedicated at least 50% to student outcome. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. That it for the candidates. Thank you. Uh, this third question will go first to 
District 1 and Mr. Unger, followed by Mr. Farnsworth. And this is the question. Population growth and overcrowding are major issues affecting Dorchester 2 schools. In May, voters approved a referendum to build new schools and improve existing facilities. First, did you support the referendum? And second, why or why not? This is a lot of hate thing. Uh, no, I did not vote for the referendum. Why? Because of the way they went about doing it. They did an early election when they knew nobody was going to vote. Okay, I don't believe in that. I think it should have been under the general election. Uh, regarding the money, yes, we probably did need it. Okay. But it's a failure. Okay. We should never have gotten to the point where we had needed the bottom referendum. It's due to a lack of poor financial planning for the past 20, 30 years. Okay, um, I'm all for how I'm going to get money. Okay, one, uh, what, two weeks ago, DD4 was presented with a $16 million check from the South Carolina Department of Education. By size, that translates to DD2, $185 million. Okay, that's about the size of the bond referendum. They just asked for it. Okay, so, uh, other ways you can raise money. We, we have local, we have federal, we have state. We need another fire. I like what the DD2 Educational Foundation is doing. I want to expand that. Um, there's a lot. Look, look at the James Island um, Night Festival. They raise about a million dollars a year. Why can't we do a festival? Why can't we do festivals like that? Why can't we have a fourth source of income? And lastly, uh, the um, council is studying right now impact fees on DD2 and DD4. May prove, as long as there's no loopholes, that may prove another uh, source of funding. Thank you. Yes, 100%. With 70% of the voting population that approved our referendum, I was not only excited to support our referendum, that referendum was beyond needed in Dorchester District 2. It's not a matter of poor planning. I want to reiterate the fact that Dorchester District 2, if you did not know this, Dorchester District 2 is in the bottom 10 of school districts in the state of South Carolina. The bottom 10 in funding for the state of South Carolina. Yet we're in the top 20 for our performance. I think that says a lot. That said, that referendum, I talked about growth earlier. When we look at what continues to come in our school district, I look at, at places like Sand Hill, I look at places like Beach Hill, they are bursting at the seams. Those teachers have more kids than they should have in their classroom, right? That's not, that's not fair, that's not, a, that's not a good, that's not a great, that's not a world-class education that we should be providing to our students. It's not a world-class facility that continued growth continues to put a strain on our school district. That bond referendum was crucial, and, and we were able to do it with no millage increase. We were able to do it with refunding of debt. So it didn't put any debt, any future debt, on anybody. How amazing is that? And I'm not trying to brag, but I can tell you the board member that just happened to be in the room that said, hey, we really need to do this bond referendum. Yes, 100%. Anybody who says no should not be on that school board. Thank you, sir. We're going to go to District 5 next, and Mr. Zingarino followed by Ms. Let's talk about bonds. When you issue bonds, if you cannot pay for them, it's the obligation of the community to levy taxes to pay for them. So I did not vote for the referendum. I'm very proud to say that. I'm also very proud to say that we have a lot of money that is being mismanaged and can be used more efficiently. We have a superintendent in this school district that earns $200,000 a year and $1,000 a month in a, school, in a uh, car allowance. Yet I've spoken to teachers who have to reach into their pockets just to pay for pencils, papers, notebooks, the basics. $1,000 a month, that's $12,000. Now, if you enter into private public partnerships and you get discounts on those items, let's say they'll triple. That's $36,000 a year worth of supplies that we could provide to our schools. Just by taking away the car allowance. 
It's not broken by the salary. I think we all would like to earn two hundred thousand dollars a year. Quite frankly, I don't think any superintendent or administrator is worth that. <coughs> Just like I don't think any sports figure is worth that. Huh? And they'll get paid. But in this case, we're talking about our children. And two hundred thousand dollars a year and one thousand dollar a month allowance for a car is absurd. Thank you, Mr. Zingarino. Next <laughs> call. I must say yes. I support it very enthusiastically. The idea of us spending money in order to put our children in a better position to learn, crammed in a classroom in a trailer is not inducive to you getting the best that you can get. Too many children in a classroom creates problems. You cannot get to every child that's in there and adequately monitor what they're doing. Have they actually done the problem correctly? Because there are too many. I've slept in room where I can even move between the tables. So, the fact that we spent the money on a bond referendum and we voted for the, we, yes, I voted for the early um, referendum because we found out, first of all, the cost was definitely going up. If you build anything lately, you see it, prices keep rising. And not only that, we figured if people are truly interested, you parents, we want you involved, that's a good opportunity to show that you wanted your children to have the best. And so what do you do? You go out and you vote, even if it's an early vote. And so we applaud those that voted with us, and we believe that we're going to see the benefit of that. Thank you. Can I rebut to that, please? Uh, not just yet. Oh, okay. We're on to District 7. Mr. Lee will go first, and then Mr. Davis. One thing you find out about me, extremely candid. Every single thing that that bond referendum was supposed to cover was a truly legitimate need. I, however, am sick and tired of kicking the can down the road. The need for that bond referendum, the need for those buildings and all the things that are covered didn't magically appear back in November of last year. We should have seen this five years ago and have been thinking about what we were going to do to fund our schools. No, I did not vote for the referendum because of the way it was done. Seventy percent of the minority of people who came out supported that. It should have been done during a regular election cycle, and quite frankly, it should have been brought up a long time ago. This is the problem we have with the lack of strategic planning and vision, the stewardship that we need, and the sustainable funding that's required for our schools. There are a lot of different sources of funding. Quite frankly, the way we fund our schools is in name. But that follows suit because the way we tax in South Carolina is in name. We need to engage the county council. They're the ones that approve any taxes. We have to engage our legislative delegations. I sat down and had a conversation with Senator Bennett before I contemplated running for this to talk about what we were going to do for funding. The legislature continues to kick that down the road. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, an opportunity to rebut. Oh, I'm going to get one more. I apologize. I voted for a bond referendum. I was actually part of a group that was pushing to do it. Um, I think as a leader, you don't look backwards and talk about what someone should have done in the past. I feel the general doesn't talk about what the general did before, but he doesn't move forward and finds ways to fix things. The superintendent does the same. So, you know, I, I see the problems we face. It's a good problem to have, honestly. People like coming here because it's a good place to live. When I moved here, DD2 was known as the best school, school district in the state. And I think we have that. And I don't think it's any one person's problem. Uh, growth is a lot of it. So, I think I have to seek out financial solutions to actually fix our shortfalls we have with, with our teachers compared to Berkeley County and Charleston County. And that's really what we need to fix most of our problems. The bond referendum is great for building facilities, other ways to fund teacher pay increases and retention. Thank you. Everybody from left to right, Mr. Martin. I'm sorry, Mr. 
I don't think $400 million in deferred maintenance is a good problem to have. I don't think it should have never happened. Okay. And yeah, we're not talking about, you know, the reason we're talking about back, going back, looking back is because this is an election for who you want to go forward. Okay. So all this happened under, uh, Justin Farnsworth has been on, on the board for 10 years. Okay. Why do you want to continue that? Lack of financial leadership. I'm not saying he did it, but he's part of the board. So I, I propose that we, that's why I wanted to have a comprehensive budget to include maintenance, to include capital reserve for new facilities. And you know, a real man pays his debts, he doesn't pass it down for the next 30 years. Okay? And I want to come up with that budget, I want to ask council for it. And I want council to approve it, unless there's a reason not to, but there won't be. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to own that. Um, you want the guy who put the $200 million bond referendum on the ballot? You're looking at it. I was in the room when we talked with our financial advisor, talking about, hey, this is an opportunity to move forward and a creative solution that does not put millage on the back of taxpayers. A no millage increase. There's no millage. We pay no more millage. Taxpayers pay no more. We refinance that. It's crazy. Every, I don't know where these stories come from. We did not put anything else. There's no extra debt on anybody. We did it with no village, right? It's, it was unheard of, it's super creative, and we did it because we've been responsible with our finances in Dorchester District. That's why we were able to do that off the pond referendum. That's why 70% of the voters that came out support it, they still support it. We need facilities, and we need them now. We're moving forward with it. It was a good thing, don't let anybody tell you it was not. I heard a couple of good things here, a couple of bad things. Leadership is what I heard here. That we have to move forward, not look backwards. Lincoln once said that a uh, man, a leader with no followers, is a man taking a walk. And I believe in that. Let me talk to you a little bit about was just spoken. You know, I want to tie two ideas together. What Ms. Lee said, which I agree with, which is kicking the can down the road, and what I heard from the song were about impact fees. Do not count on the county council and the town council to levy impact fees or sufficient impact fees. That's why you see all the growth in this community, but no infrastructure being addressed. Their donors are also the villagers, so you're not going to get anything from them. That's sufficient. Okay. I believe that we need to examine how money is being spent. My career, even though I served in the military, was finance and economics. And I can tell you when you say there's no village, there's nothing, don't worry about it. Worry about it five years from now when you see taxes that are drawn from other sources that you have to pay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're having a little bit of answer creep, so we'll try to rein it in a bit, pay close attention to Heidi, she'll help you do that. Sorry, Heidi. Stop. He had the right to this. Anyway, I just want to say this. For those of you that are saying we are not playing ahead, you see that gold sheet up here? That's been up here for a while, so that tells me some of the people that are speaking have not been to our board meetings. We have planned out what we want to happen. We don't just do it just to do it. And we check off whenever something has been accomplished. So there is a plan. We've already started to talk about moving toward year 2030 and how many students we'll have and what we need to do to accommodate them. You may not hear everything, but if you come to the board meeting, you will hear a lot. And maybe working together, we'll get a lot more done. It's okay to be run for the board, but I just want you to make sure that you not just run, but you participate before you get on the board in whatever you can do. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Davidson, Mr. Lee. Yeah, just one quick item. Um, when you're talking about moving forward, it doesn't mean you forget the history from the past. It just doesn't mean you don't point fingers. That's not the way to fix things. If I was elected on the board, I would have to work with some of these people and others. 
Uh, if you don't treat them in a business-like manner, the way I work in a, in a professional environment, you're not going to get things done. And I think uh, it's always been my way to do that, and do it in a Christ-like manner. And I think it's important for, it's not about adults arguing over things. It's about getting stuff done for children. I was at those four things. I have an informed opinion. I used to be on, I was an elected school board member previously. I understand how they work. I observed everything that took place in here, and that's how I formed my opinion. I would just simply ask, Justin, I don't want to point you out, but so this referendum we just passed is $200 million. It's a 30 year bond. How are we going to pay for everything else that we know we already need? We're going to have to go back for another bond. And we're going to have to be transparent. And we're going to have to explain to the community that the next time we come, it's not going to be for a $200 million bond referendum. I lived through a billion dollar bond referendum up in the upstate. And you know what? When they finished the program, it was a fast build, three to four year program. Every single building they opened was at capacity. Why? Because of the people doing the planning. The people not paying attention to the things that matter. These things are great visuals. Okay? Talk to somebody that's actually done long term planning. Thank you, sir. We will move on to question four. And for this uh, set of answers, we'll begin with District 5 and Ms. Powell first. The question. The teacher shortage has been a chronic problem across the country and recent increases in teacher pay have helped to alleviate it. Would you advocate for further increases in pay and would you support pay increases based on merit? Wholeheartedly, I would vote for teacher pay increase to happen yearly. Would I do it on merit? There's a lot that goes in paying teachers based on merit. Because certain children are placed in certain classes that makes it very difficult for you maybe to achieve certain goals that you may set. So if you're doing it strictly on merit, merit can have a part to play, but it shouldn't be the only means by which you give those increases. Because it depends on who you have been given to work with. The other thing, what was the other part of that? The other thing. More pay increases and would you have support? Yes, we are now at 47,000. Our neighbors are automatically getting 52, and then it's easy for them to get 5,000 more, 5,000 next semester. We don't have that money. The people that are with us now, they're here because they want to be. I visited the class the other day, and this teacher told me, he brings home $2,300 a month. His rent is eighteen. dollars What are we supposed to do with that? Should I not advocate for him to get more money? Yes. So, definitely, I will be asking for more money. Thank you. Mr. Zingarino. Yes, I believe we need to invest in good teachers. And I think we need to invest in training those that are not good become great teachers. In any industry that you're in, you have great people and you have people that are not exactly doing the job and they need a little bit more training and development. So yes, I would absolutely say we need to invest in it. Should it be on meritocracy? Absolutely. Everything in this country is based on, or should have been based on, it was in the past, it isn't now, based on meritocracy. I don't believe in, in uh, participation trophies and things like that. I just simply don't. I'm not that type of person. I believe that you earn what you get. DEI doesn't work. DEI stands for didn't earn. And I cannot see that introduced into our school systems. Nor can I see CRT, the 1619 Project, or any other forms of revisionist history in our schools. That's what's hurting our children. We talked before about children. Let's talk about that. We're hurting our children by indoctrinating them, not educating them. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, for District 7, Mr. Davidson, you'll be first, and then Mr. Lee. Um, I absolutely believe we have to pay our teachers more. If you're running a construction company, and the company uh, three miles down the road was paying their employees that does the exact, exact same job, 5000 more a year, you know, how hard is it going to be for you to staff the company? And that's what we're faced with today. You look around here in, in Somerville, and you say, how can we be such a poor school district? Well, it goes back to what I said earlier. The solution to this problem, to get us on par with Berkeley and Charleston County, is not as far-fetched as you might think. It's really an easy solution. Go look. I've been on the map from the CPA. Look at the taxes, uh, the fees and little taxes for Western Dorchester County compared to what they are in Eastern Dorchester County. Match up where the tax rolls are, where the people are, spread it out equally fairly, and you're going to see a problem fixed. Merit is absolutely important, but as mentioned before, if you're given a classroom full of people that have not performed in the prior year, you have to take that into account when you're judging them. As a school board member, it's not our job to micromanage the school district. It's not our job to micromanage teachers. Uh, we provide for the school district. We provide for the superintendent. It is his job to make sure he uses those assets the best that he can. But we have to give him solutions with our um, legislative lobby that is already in place, it's happening, and I've done this for years, so I would appreciate your support. Mr. Lee? So really a two-pronged question. Do uh, you support paying teachers more, and then secondly, how do you pay for it? It's an emotional issue for some, and I think it's the responsibility of the board to take a cold, sober, practical look at it. The reality is, is we have X number of students that have to be educated. That means we have to have X number of teachers at various levels. We don't currently have a system of evaluating teachers that supports rewarding on merit. I'd be in favor of exploring that, seeing if that's something that could help. But the current situation is very simple. The market is driving salaries for teachers in this area. That's not the only reason we have a teacher retention and recruitment problem. It's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. So the question, do I support paying teachers more? I believe the evidence is very clear. We are not competitive in the market that we have to compete for teachers. Would I support paying teachers uh, based on merit and performance? Not currently, because we don't have a system in place that you can effectively do that. But we could sit down, other districts around the country have moved to a more merit-based type of uh, performance management approach for teachers, and we should explore that. But we do have to realize we're not a factory floor, we're not turning out widgets, we're dealing with children. And children are a, a rather dynamic commodity with which we have to work to educate. Sir, Mr. Marjorie will be next uh, when we're done. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, for sure. Um, hands down, we, we have to pay our teachers more. Um, and, and further than that, what it really speaks to is we have to treat them as professionals, right? They go to school, they get their degrees, they have master's degrees, they have doctorate degrees. We, we have to not only pay them like a professional, we have to treat them like professionals. We have to figure out what is being put on their backs. We have to figure out the red tape that is in their way to be a professional. We expect that. I told you earlier, the magic happens when that teacher closes that door and they're in their classroom. That's when the magic happens. It's an unbelievable thing. To see a child go from here to here with that teacher in the classroom, there's nothing more precious in this world than that. It's amazing. So I hope everybody understands that we have to treat them like professionals. As far as the, the meritocracy, the merit-based uh, programs, um, I would actually um, say the same thing that Mr. Lee said. I, I don't know that we have a true evaluation system to be able to put that in place today where that would be a system uh, that actually generates results. So if we're going to put in that type of system, the only reason we would do that is to generate results. I will tell you, if you look at the research around the country, there are districts that have gone to a merit-based system. The research is showing us that their performance, their test scores, their graduation rates, 
uh, believe it or not, it's actually not any higher, in some cases a lot lower, um, than districts that don't have that. So I'd say we need to evaluate it before we go down any of those roads. Thank you, sir. Mr. Unger. The budget should be flat the values of the community. Okay, so the community wants to pay teachers more, which they make about fifty-five hundred fifty three thousand dollars a year. I think that should be included in the comprehensive budget. Right? No problem with that. Okay. I think everyone deserves to make as much as they possibly can, and I do believe in merit. But I think we can develop a matrix to evaluate teachers uh, on merit, and I think it can run through the whole spectrum. Okay. Um, and public oh, bonuses for, for, for based, based on that. Okay, we can certainly offer pay bonuses for for those who exceed uh, the threshold as far as merit goes. Okay. But first, we have to have a comprehensive budget. We have to let the community know what that budget is, and it will reflect our values. And I certainly don't want to pay teachers as much as they deserve. But right now, 87% of our budget goes to administration and staff and teaching and everybody involved. That doesn't leave much room for the kids. And the kids are what it's all about. And we have to have innovative programs, we have to do all kinds of things to encourage kids for what they want to do uh, when they get out. So I support all of that. And I think teachers should, should make a great living wage. And you're going to get some really good ones once you do that. Thank you. Sir, I sent some enthusiasm for rebuttal. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, 88, the number is 88 percent. 88 percent of our budget goes directly to instruction. If you look at our pie chart, 88 percent of our nearly $300 million budget goes directly to instruction, classroom instruction. The vast majority of that, we hire about 4,000 folks in Dorchester District 2. The vast, just like any business, I run a business, the vast majority of my business is my staffing. It's the exact same thing. So when I say direct instructional purpose, 88%, that's our staff. That's our teachers. That's what we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're mirroring what the community wants us to do. And, and I think, again, 88%, that's phenomenal. Direct classroom instruction. We're doing a lot with a little. Thank you. Um, Ms. Powell, and then Mr. Zangarino. When I ran in 2022, the hot topic was CRT. I asked the average person when they asked me, do you agree with CRT? I said, ma'am, sir, what is CRT? None of them were able to tell me what it was. I had heard about it, so I researched it. And when I researched it, it has nothing to do with what we teach K-12. Nothing. That is a upper, it had to do with lawyers and all of these, the issues that they wanted to um, find information on why certain things exist. It had nothing to do with what we teach. I taught 37 years and I was upset that no one told me to teach CRT or how to teach it. And then there's the word about indoctrination. How are we indoctrinating the kids? If we could, we would indoctrinate them to do your homework. Sit down and listen. Ask questions when you're confused. Don't wait until we get to the end and say, I don't understand. We would indoctrinate them to do certain things. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Is that it, <clears throat> So we've heard a lot of good Things here, you don't mind if I say. We, we um, I agree with Mr. Lee. Um, yeah, meritocracy, we need to have a plan for it. We hear a lot of good statements being made here. We need to pay people like professionals. Uh, ultimately, the children are most important, and then we've heard that here. The children are the most important. But, but when we hear things like we have to pay teachers like professionals, what, what, what does that mean? And what is a professional pay? There has to be a system of meritocracy. There has to be something in place that provides for proving what that teacher should earn. 
I heard the comment here that CRT was never discussed, although I do know that one of the board members here when elected two years ago was asked about color in the classroom, and the comment was made that color of students is very important and we all should be aware of that. No, we shouldn't. We should be all one people. And when you introduce color or anything else, you can never have a conversation about equality. Thank you, Mr. Zingarino. Gentlemen on the left, nothing. Okay. We are going to have one more question. Let's hold it with you all. We'll be done shortly. Uh, and this is the fifth question. And the first answer will be taken by Mr. Lee and Mr. Seth. And that question is as follows. While none of Dorchester's two schools are rated below average or unsatisfactory, there continue to be gaps in academic success that separate children based on their economic status or the color of their skin. What role do you see for the school board in seeing these gaps closed? Again, Mr. Lee is first, then Mr. Diggs. So I think the question is, what is the board's role in dealing with the socioeconomic impacts that drive student, that impact student achievement? Uh, and the answer is, again, from an advocacy and a leadership and advisory perspective, we should be working with the community to point those things out and helping uh, to drive attention from the community. One of the challenges we have in public education is we've tried to make our schools the be-all and the end-all for everything for every child. And as I said, I'm very candid. We need a clear, cold, and sober view to recognize that cannot happen. We have to focus on the things we can do. There are programs like free lunch programs and things like that that, that are very tactical and logistical and make a lot of sense. But we also have tons of other programs in our social services systems that supposedly are there to try and help close those gaps before the children in our schools. Why aren't they producing the results they should? So as far as I'm concerned, the school board's primary role is to advocate for that, but continue to push the focus to what the mission of the public schools should be providing education and the basic skills for our children, all children, who are in our public schools. Thank you. Mr. Davison? Yeah, um, we do have a problem in our schools. Uh, I think I read recently on our DDT website that 53% of our families in our schools are in poverty levels. So that's a hurdle that you're always going to be dealing with. And, you know, I, you can only stretch a dollar so many ways. So I, I think we do, overall, a good job of providing things for children that don't necessarily get it at home. But it goes back to money. How can we generate more money? Because we're not all living in poverty level. And, you know, as a CPA, I have a lot of clients that I can see sponsoring teacher break rooms and buying teacher supplies like the foundation's already done, done a good job of. But it's something we can expand on. We can excite our community, get them involved, and make sure no kid gets left behind. I think sometimes in the past we've spent too much time trying to push a square into a circle. Um, if a kid shows that he's mechanically inclined and enjoys doing that kind of stuff, but he does enjoy schoolwork, don't push a square into a circle. Embrace that. Say, man, there are so many great jobs that you can do that you will be inspired to do. We need to inspire children. Um, we can inspire teachers. Um, so, as adults, we can't fix all the problems, but we, we certainly can improve. And uh, that's it. Thank you, sir. From District 1, Mr. Unger, and then Mr. Farnsworth. May I ask you a question? <coughs> the question is. That while none of the Dorchester two schools are rated below average or unsatisfactory, there continue to be gaps in academic success that separate children based on their economic status or the color of their skin. What role do you see for the school board in seeing these gaps closed? Thank you. Um, you're actually right. It was 53. I was shocked to know that statistic that 53% are in poverty. 
and they definitely come from, uh, they have that kind of disadvantage when it comes to school. They a lot of times don't have the parental support uh, to do that. What can we do as a board? We treat everybody the same, number one, but we offer mentoring and, and, and help. I like to see peers helping peers. A big brother, big sister program throughout our schools in which we take top kids that are doing performing well and actually have them be as mentors to their, to their peers. Maybe junior seniors, parent after freshman. Okay? I think that would go a long way. When, uh, I used my daughter as an example. She was taking geometry in eighth grade and she had to do it remotely because there's so few people in the eighth grade. And she had about four different remote teachers throughout the course of the year. She ended up getting near 100 in geometry. You know why? Because of her big sister. She would go to her sister. So we need to, or those families that are disadvantaged, we need to go and get this student support and help them, help them teach their, their peers who better to do it. And um, so I think that would be a great way to do it. Thank you. Roger. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I will tell you, and when you look at uh, Dorchester District, we, we've created our own problem. Um, we, we continue to talk about growth. Um, people continue to move to Somerville, to Dorchester District, to North Charleston um, because of Dorchester District 2. If you look at that real estate ad, it says DD2. Right? So, and, and I say that because I'm very prideful of the fact that as a school district, we have always, always, always believed in the power of equitable resources across our entire school district. So it doesn't matter if I'm talking about Windsor Hill all the way on the other side of North Charleston, or if I'm talking about Knightsville Elementary, obviously here in Knightsville. It doesn't matter. The equitable resources for every single student in those schools, in those classrooms, right? using our Title I funding wisely for those children that are in poverty. Those types of things, we have to continue to look at those pieces of the puzzle and understand that every single child, as long as we keep the mindset and we know in our hearts that every single child can, will, and has to have the opportunity, it's their God-given right to have an education, to have a world-class education. That's our job. So as a board, we have to get equitable resources to our entire school district. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Mr. Zingarino, you're next, and then Ms. Powell. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with a lot of what I've heard here. Um, <clears throat> we shouldn't be looking at color, religion, nothing of that nature. Students should be given equal opportunity to succeed. However, teachers don't always know what the personal circumstances are in the household. That's why we have to have parents involved. That's why as a school member, it is incumbent, I believe, to go out and meet with parents and talk about what's going on, what are some of the struggles, so that we can help those students succeed. Because at the end of the day, the only thing that is important is that every student succeeds. It doesn't matter if they come from the richest family or from the poorest family. I don't look at that at all, and I don't think anybody should. We need to focus on the student. Boy and girl, and yes, boy and girl, and nothing else. What do you need? And we should be providing that. And we should be focusing on the basics. Reading, writing, math, science, history. And we should be teaching civics. Children should learn about government, the government around them, and money management. How to balance assets and liabilities and how to spend and save money. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Stop. As I heard the question, my mind went back, so I'm going to have to be real. I'm the only person of color sitting on this board. I am also the person that technically would have been at an economical disadvantage. But my mother said to all three of her daughters, you will finish high school and you will not just stop there but you will go further. 
She set the expectation from day one. Number one, I better not have to come into that school because of your behavior. If I do, we're going to take care of business. Secondly, she never let us get the attitude, well, I can't do this. I can't do that because of the color of my skin. Her whole thing was simply this. You can do whatever it is that you want to do, but you got to work at it. If you are an A student in her house, you brought home A's. If you were a C student, you brought the C. And she was okay with that. So I, parents, again, that's why I'm hopping on parents. Because of my mother, I stand before you. All three of her children were in college at one time. All three of us are graduating. Her granddaughter as her doctors, etc. I'm saying that to say this. Parents, you have a very important role. Stop believing that the school can solve everything. We can't. You may or may not hope to me, but guess what? I'm going to tell you the truth. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we'll be in the same place and keep the same attitude. Thank you, ma'am. Any comments left or right? Uh, seeing none here, Mr. Zimbarino. Zimbarino. Yes, thank you. I agree with Ms. Powell. Um, she doesn't realize, though, that I am a man of color. Um, my background is very diverse. And uh, in my background is color. Um, I don't mean not that. And I like what she said about the fact that her mother drove her to be successful. My parents did too. My parents did too. I grew up in a neighborhood where if you complained, you were bullied. Of course, today we talk about bullying in a different sense, right? That it's not right to do, and we address it now. But I grew up in a neighborhood where you had to be tough. And so I can appreciate what she's saying. I understand what she's saying. Um, but we have to be color blind. Thank you, sir. Students are what's most important. Very good. Yes. Yes. This short little comment. I love your mother. I've never met her. <laughs> She's and I wish God. we could take that story yeah. and every parent could hear that story at the start of every school year. Because that's the kind of community involvement, parental involvement we have. Yeah, real quick, just to touch on the things that others have mentioned. I had been mentoring today, I had a young man that raised was coming out and he said he's, he's kind of falling behind in math. And I shared a story from college, I said, I wouldn't pass calculus if I didn't have a math lab where I could go and have someone show me how to do problems. And once someone showed me, then I understood them. And we have, we have plans in place right now. We have to motivate our parents. We have to find a way to get the connection to have a, a motivational message to the parents that you got to get involved. Back the kid wants to go to after school, uh, to tutoring, free tutoring, but he didn't have a ride home. So I said, listen, you know, ask your parent. If they can't do it, if they can't find someone else, we're not allowed to talk to you as a mentor. Uh, get your parent to reach out to us. One of us will get you on if that's what it takes. And that's what we need to do as a community. No kid left behind. I said, ask your teacher. See if they can help you during lunch. If she, if they don't help you, ask the principal. But keep asking until you get what you need. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're through the questions, all the questions that we have time for, and we'll now move to closing statements. And as I said at the outset, we will reverse the order of the opening statements, which means we'll begin with District 7, and Mr. Lee will go first, followed by Mr. Davidson. I'm Jim Lee, I'm running for the District 7 seat. I bring a unique combination of experience, both as a parent, as a 40-year business professional, as a retired Air Force member, as a former elected school board member and adjunct college professor. Don't have time to tell you everything about me. I encourage you to go to my campaign website, jimleeforgd2.com. You can find more about my background, more about my thoughts on the various issues. You can contact and interact with me. 
And on November 5th, or whenever it is you choose to go to the polls, if you choose to vote early, uh, I encourage you to vote for Jim Lee, the shortest name, the last name, and the last office on the District 7 ballot. Thank you. Um, Patrick Davis again, PatrickForBDG.com. I'm CPA, I grew up here, passionate about the community, spent my whole life helping, all my whole life helping children. And I'd like to have the opportunity to grow D2 to what we, we think it can be. Um, I would love to have her vote. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. I think I have a plan in place to get our teachers where they need to be to get the student outcome that we need. But it's a, a never ending problem. It's going to be, you're never done, there's always more to do. So I, I'd like to be a part of that if you guys have given the chance. Mr. Tingarino. Thank you to everyone who attended. I, I, I appreciate it. I know everyone here appreciates it as well. Again, my name is Glenn Zingarino. I'm running for DD2 School Board C5. You couldn't hear everything that I would believe in and want to talk to you about. And certainly, I think everyone here would say the same thing about what they believe in. Um, I encourage you to go to my Facebook page. I will tell you, and I'm very honest in saying this, this is a nonpartisan election, and I am not putting campaign signs up. I am not sending flyers or mailers out, because in the next few weeks, you're going to be inundated with so much stuff, you're not going to know what you're going to do. From the president on down, so I'm not doing that. I'm carrying on word of mouth. A couple of things you didn't hear is that I believe in competition. That means I believe in school choice. I believe that taxes should be diverted to the choice of the parents. And I believe that I have a plan for eliminating taxes, school taxes on seniors in a five to seven year period. Again, I'm Glenn Zimarino. I'd be humbled to have your vote. If you don't want to vote for me, then it's a lovely way to hear. We'll do the job. Thank you. I'm Cynthia Powell, running for C5. I would greatly appreciate your vote. Along with everything else that we have already started to do on the board, one of my focus will be parents. I will be calling you. I will be contacting you. I want you to get involved because truly, your involvement will make the difference in your life and the lives of your children. We just need you to work with us Bring your ideas to us so that we can work together. Thank you for all of you that came out. Cynthia Powell, C5. I look forward to your vote for me. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I'm here. Uh, District 1, number 1. I appreciate your vote. My website is workingforyoudd2.com. Um, you would like me. Something you may not heard tonight, besides financial responsibility, and um, it's not innovation. Okay, so I want to get the, my son. I, I want to do more classes for the trades. Um, this economy is shifting greatly to the skills-based economy, and our schools have to stay ahead of that. I have a son who's, who's um, taking well, and he's absolutely loving it. And we need to do more. I have a whole ton of ideas about all different types of things, including student government, and actually doing mock government in school with debate and all kinds of things. So I have lots of ideas I want to bring to the board. I really appreciate your vote. And I thank you all very much for coming out here tonight. It shows a lot. I just want to say thank you again for taking the time to be here this evening. Uh, it means a lot. It means a lot to come out and, and learn what we're about to the candidates. It, it takes a lot, we would all agree, it takes a lot to run for this office. Um, I appreciate each and every one of you. I appreciate the, the exchange of ideas that we've had tonight. I go back to my why. If you're going to click my name on that ballot, you have to understand why Justin Farnsworth does what he does. It's really simple. We have kids in our district. A wife is an educator. I've got a local business right here in DD2. It's so, 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 so important to me. This district, what we stand for, our kids, it's all about our kids. At the end of the day, I love, love, love Northchester District 2. I love each of you for being here. 
Justin Parthor, I will be humbled, I will be honored to have your vote in this election. Please find me on Facebook, and uh, again, thank you. Have a great night. Well, thank you first to each of the candidates for being here, for your thoughtful responses, and for your service to this community. Uh, thank you to the audience and those who choose to watch the video that will be available for taking time to hear from the candidates. We encourage all voters to study the issues carefully, learn about the positions of each candidate, and vote for the candidate of your choice on November 5th. Early voting starts October 21st. Check your voter registration status and polling locations on scvotes.gov. Due to Hurricane Helene, the deadline for registering to vote in South Carolina has been extended to October 14. You can register to vote online at scvotes.gov or at the League of Women Voters, vote411.org. And candidate information and answers to questions for all the races can also be found on vote411.org. Finally, thank you again to our host and our co-sponsors for organizing this forum. We were running against Glenn and not doing any signs or flares or anything else. <laughs> <laughs>